GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome, I'm Alastair Stewart and for the next two hours I'll be keeping you company on TV and radio with the stories that really matter across the country and indeed across the world. We've plenty coming up. I'll be joined by expert guests to unpack the developments in Ukraine. Was President Biden's call for regime change a blunder? Plus, here, calls for Sunak to rethink help for those facing massive energy price hikes. We'll be discussing that, plus much more. But first, let's bring you right up to date with all of the news. Here's Bethany Elsie. Thanks, Alistair. Good afternoon. It's one minute past 12. The chief of Ukraine's military intelligence is warning Russia is trying to split Ukraine in two by uniting occupied territories in the east. Ukraine's head of military intelligence predicts Ukrainian guerrilla warfare will begin in those areas soon. Local media reports the head of the self-proclaimed Luhansk Republic has said the region may hold a referendum on joining Russia. Two humanitarian corridors have been agreed for today out of Donetsk and Luhansk to evacuate civilians. Western Ukraine, which has been largely unaffected by shelling during the conflict, has come under increasing fire. The country's interior ministry says Russia has started to target fuel depots and fuel food storage facilities in Lviv. Overnight, four missiles hit the city just 40 miles from the Polish border. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has asked Western countries if they're intimidated by Russia and demanded more military supplies. Only 1% of all NATO aircraft and 1% of all NATO tanks. 1%. We did not ask for more and we do not ask for more. We have already been waiting for 31 days. So who is running the Euro-Atlantic community? Is it still Moscow because of threats? The White House has been swift to deny U.S. president was calling for regime change in Moscow. Joe Biden called Vladimir Putin a butcher and said he cannot remain in power. He made an impassioned speech in Warsaw after meeting with Poland's president and Ukrainian refugees. The Kremlin has responded, saying the people of Russia, not America, should choose its leader. NATO historian Dr. Peter Chadwick Adams believes Biden's comment were meant to reassure nations who are at risk of Putin's aggression. Um, and so his comments yesterday, they can be taken out of context by Russia, and they were always going to be, was aimed really at reassuring those nations who feel most nervous about Russia. And I think that's what he achieved. 
In other news, the second black box from the China Eastern Airlines plane that crashed last Monday has been recovered. Rescuers say the flight data recorder was found underground, 40 metres from where the Boeing 737 crashed in the Gangxi region in southern China. It'll now be examined with the cockpit voice recorder that was found last week. All 132 people on board the plane have been confirmed dead. 600,000 people are being invited for COVID booster jabs next week. It's as infection levels reach near record highs in England, with official figures estimating one in 16 people had coronavirus last week. Professor Hugh Pennington, a bacteriologist at the University of Aberdeen, says the virus is unlike any other. One thing that's absolutely characteristic about all the variants of uh, COVID is uh, the relationship with age. The older you are, the more likely you are to have a whole, uh, you know, a hard time, and that's why they're focusing with the booster on, on you know, uh, on people with, you know, damaged immune systems, but also, uh, and the most important group in terms of numbers are are the elderly. The school week will need to be at least 32 and a half hours long for everyone by September next year. That's under levelling up plans in the government's new schools white paper, which will be published tomorrow. The Department for Education says some pupils are missing out on around two weeks' worth of schooling every year. After two years, Gatwick Airport is reopening its South Terminal to meet expected strong demand for people going abroad this summer. It was closed in June 2020 to reduce costs during the pandemic. London's Gatwick chief executive, Stuart Wingate, says travelling is now almost back to how it was before the pandemic. The, uh, the summer season ahead of us, uh, we're going to start to see more airlines uh, operating at the airport and we're going to start recovering uh, back towards 2019 passenger levels. There's absolutely no question that there's strong demand. Uh, we know that by talking to all of our key airlines. Uh, so we call it pent-up demand, people who haven't been able to travel, who really now want to travel. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge have left the Bahamas, ending their eight-day tour of the Caribbean. As his final engagement, Prince William donned a wetsuit and dived underwater to plant coral in the sea. He was joined by a winner from the Revive Our Oceans category in his £50 million Earthshot prize. Kate wore a coral pink dress to match the colour of the coral farmed and protected in the Grand Bahamas. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now, it's back to Alice Stewart and friends. Bethany, thanks very much indeed. Coming up this afternoon on Alistair Stewart and Friends, the White House says that President Biden was not calling for regime change when he said Putin cannot remain in power in that speech in Warsaw yesterday. Was this just a blunder on his part or a little more? And overnight, the western city of Lviv, which had been spared the worst of the fighting, has come under heavy rocket fire. Joining me now in the studio are our expert guests who will unpack all of that plus much more. Also coming up later on in the programme, we'll be crossing live to Calendar in Scotland, where 52 children from an orphanage in Ukraine have arrived after fleeing the violence in their country. We'll find out how they're getting on as they begin their new lives here in the UK. Plus... Oh yes, the 90s pop legend Chesney Hawkes will be here on the sofa to discuss his new album, but also what it was like trying to earn a living during Covid. And as always, we want to hear from you. Email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk. We are also on Twitter and Facebook. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Within hours of Russia's Ministry of Defence saying that the Donbass and eastern Ukraine were its new targets, they hit Lviv in the west with cruise missiles. Hours later, on this programme, the Klitschko brothers told me an essential truth. Putin is a liar. His plan remains intact, they said, the conquest of Ukraine. And if he succeeds, well, who knows where else? President Joe Biden recognised that we are at a crucial moment when he said in Warsaw yesterday that the defence of Ukraine against Russian aggression was, and I quote, the test of this generation. It was, he said, 
democracy versus dictatorship. In the old days of the Cold War, American presidents seldom shrunk from the challenge. I remember very well in 1987, in Berlin, President Ron Reagan imploring the new, promisingly progressive president of the Soviet Union, Mr Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Well, two years later, the people of Berlin did just that, and many of us thought that was it. Freedom and democracy had won, the future was bright and secure. But with Putin in power, we're back to the bad old days. In his big speech in Warsaw yesterday, Joe Biden recognised that invoking the memory of a divided Berlin, the fall of the wall and the end of the Soviet dominance of Eastern Europe and, indeed, the fall of the Soviet Union itself. But the challenge was back, he said. Biden, having already called Putin a war criminal and a butcher, said he was waging a war not worthy of the Russian people. He called on the people to put an end to it, as they had done in Berlin in 1989. He went on to say Putin could not remain in power, which to some crossed a line. The White House instantly briefed, oh, he's not really what he meant. Why, you might ask, if a leader is a war criminal and a butcher, you might just think it reasonable to say he's got to go. And Russia has said from the outset it also wants regime change in Ukraine. So today we'll assess why all of that touched such a nerve in the global corridors of power. But as I said, I also want to hear what you think. Email me your views at gbviews at gbnews.uk. Tweet or go on Facebook. And you've already been busy at it. We'll share some of that uh, a little later on. And don't forget, join us by subscribing to our YouTube channel, where, amongst other things, you can also see that amazing interview with the Klitschko brothers. I have a great lineup on the sofa today. I'm delighted to be joined by former Downing Street advisor and political commentator Sean Worth, uh, by Dame Pauline Neville Jones, former Minister of State for Security and Counterterrorism at the Home Office, and a new friend, Anthony Gould, who's the former head of Kodak, who's worked with the Kremlin over many decades and has met and chatted with Vladimir uh, Putin. Um, thank you all very much indeed. Welcome back. And a very warm welcome to you. Uh, first question to all of you. Was Biden stating the obvious in Warsaw about democracy versus dictatorship, or has he upped the stakes? Well, he was stating the obvious, in my view. And you can argue, given that everybody is extremely worried about Putin's state of mind, whether he can enlarge the war, uh, that you need to be cautious in your utterances. Um, do I share the sentiment? Most certainly. Um, and do we think that we could seriously negotiate? At some point, there will have to be a negotiation with somebody who has, is a proven liar. Mm. And what he's doing at the moment, you know, he's, he's giving himself options in, in uh, Ukraine. You know, he could, he, he, might, he's not, he hasn't denied that, he, that the, the game is regime change. Mm. On the other hand, he's opening a path possibly to sure. taking less. Would your old boss... Dave Cameron have recognised that distinction when he was dealing with Gaddafi in Libya um, or Boris Johnson right now, who's been arguably more cautious about mm. his choice of words than Joe Biden. Well, I did, um, I did wonder, actually, and, and our friends here are far more expert than me to judge this one, but um, you know, Biden is rather elderly. He, has, he does make uh, slips of the tongue. And it, it was unusual to me uh, as an observer of this to see the White House correcting, not clarifying, but literally correcting him, sort of almost slap, what we call a slap down if, if somebody goes off piste and says something. And I do wonder if the international community are on a knife edge, really, and just desperate not to uh, escalate too far. And, they, and, and perhaps the Kremlin demanded a clarification of mm. whether, was this a question of intent, yeah. regime change, or was it something yeah. uh, he, he aspired to? And there was, a, there was that immediate slap down overnight. It's, it's such a delicate walking on eggshells. I mean, you know the Kremlin going right back to the Gorbachev days that I mentioned in my, uh, in my, in my general introduction. Uh, and indeed, the uh, foreign ministry in Moscow called in the American ambassador to say, don't you do that. I mean, to me, it was a statement of the blindingly obvious, which I think Pauline nodded to as well. Well, I agree. But what the mistake we've been making for years is assuming that a dictator thinks like we do. A dictator has an objective. It's long term. Our politicians think in terms of four or five years maximum. So that's the first error we made. All the signals were there. 
But we even pretend that we believe that he wouldn't invade Ukraine when he had everything there. He will tell us what he wants us to believe, and if we're, in my view, stupid enough to believe it, then we suffer. And this is what worries me, that if you have a regime change, who are you going to get in place of him? 70% of Russians believe what they're being told. I don't think there's a strong move in Russia to get rid of Putin. And that's the only way he'll go, yeah. un unless we're prepared to fight a war. Fascinating point, though, mm. because that little bit within the speech as well, where Biden said, I, and Johnson said it 48 hours ago as well, I don't dislike Russians, I love Russians, I love their culture, this, that and the other. But this is a war, said Joe Biden, that is not worthy of the Russian people. That's a direct appeal to folk who, frankly, haven't got the power to topple him. The ordinary public clearly don't. I mean, no. This is not, not an elective uh, regime at all. Uh, whether there is room for you know, palace coup, uh, that's a different issue. Would we find you know, people inside the regime who weren't also compromised is a very good question. This is, a, I mean, this is very difficult stuff. Mm. Um, you can understand why, particularly in Warsaw, uh, Biden might say that. Poland, above all, feels threatened. Yes. And is threatened. So, and, and, and one of Zelensky's most potent contributions days, if not weeks ago now, is if, God forbid, we fall, mm. then Moldova, the Baltics, right up to the wall mm. in Berlin. So all of that indicates that you do, need to be, do, do, do need to be cautious. On the other hand, you know, I do think frank speaking matters in, 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 yeah. in public life. People do need to actually understand that this man is absolutely unacceptable. Yeah. Mm. Take you back to your world as well, because that's a fascinating point about the White House. I mean, not on reflection, but instantly correcting. Mm. Mm. That world that you occupied for so long, where you've got special advisers working to ministers, and you've got the ministers themselves and the civil service, had this been within the United Kingdom, within Downing Street, would it equally have put a cat amongst the pigeons? Or would they have said, it's Boris? I... I... Possibly. Um, I, I think that the, the fact is, I mean, as far as I, I recall, um, you know, matters of this kind of nature where you're talking about international conflict and war, you don't really get political advisers, uh, you know, allowed to have opinions and to, to make the running on this. You, you know, there's some incredibly good people in the Foreign Office and, and in the Ministry of Defence and, you know, we defer to them completely. So if a politician does go off and says the wrong thing, there, there is normally a clarification. I mean, I was just, when I said earlier, I was just surprised that, that I was just surprised that the sort of, uh, it, was, it wasn't a clarification, it was a correction. He didn't, he wasn't supposed to say that. Mm. We have no intent on regime change. You know? sure. So okay. it, it kind of felt that a, that a nervous White House saying something so it didn't escalate things too far. And that, okay. that's, that's the question I have sure. about whether people are really worried about the, the the actions of NATO, and we're seeing calls from uh, uh, just a minute ago, the president of Ukraine wants more, and you, uh, NATO is slightly holding back. So I just wonder how, how tense everything really is behind the scenes. The flip side of that coin, then, in a sense, is that, that there's not going to be a deal, although everybody says there needs to be a deal. There maybe isn't going to be a deal with this guy. You dealt with Brezhnev, you dealt with Gorbachev, all of whom were people who were prepared to do deals. And you said earlier on in this conversation, if you're dealing with a dictator, it's a different set of rules. Is Putin, who you've met and talked to, a man we, the West and NATO, can do a deal with? Well, I met Putin before he became president. I, from people who know him now, infer he's a very changed individual. And that's the danger of assuming, because at that time he was basically a KGB officer. And he did not approve of Gorbachev, in his view, giving away the Soviet empire. Now, I don't think that he is a long-term planner in the way of strategic planning of a war. And I think he's been told by his generals that this would all be over fairly quickly. You've got Crimea you've got Georgia, and this would be another move for Luhansk and Donetsk, yeah. and, and you'd be all over. Now he's in a situation where he's got to find somebody who will tell him how he moves next, mm. because he's not a war strategist. He is a thinker about, the, if you like, the broader Russia, 
And that's what worries me, that if he was deposed, is there an assumption that the person who'd replace him would be that radically yeah. Pauline, different? Pauline, do you think a deal can be done? I mean, we, I we, we had on, on, on the programme yesterday a man you know very well, Sir Tony Brenton, who was, was our man in Moscow uh, some years ago, and he said, look, you've got to rise above it. A deal's got to be done because inevitably a deal is always done. But with Putin? Well, let's think about this. I mean, I don't think that one could believe anything that Putin said. Yeah. So I would not you know, want to be in a negotiating room with him alone. We may find a situation in which there is a large number of people, um, and that would be better than having, obviously, just him. But I, I really do wonder about the ability of the, uh, of, of the credibility of any, of any um, agreement that was struck with this man. Uh, could we rely on it? Now, we, might, we, may, we may be in a situation where there is no, no one else to talk to. If that's the case, I cannot see how any of the measures that we've taken to isolate and to impoverish Russia, and this is very, very serious for the Russian people, I don't see how we will be able to let up on any of those precautions. That will be the problem. Mm. So, so uh, I mean, we haven't reached this stage yet, no. but I do think we need to start thinking about it. And I, of, I certainly would want to see us with other people in the in the room yeah. to negotiate with. Well, mm. Indeed, well, partly why, why mm. I've gone down this road today yep. and I was thinking mm. long and hard and deep about mm. it at, at last night. The other thing that crossed my mind, and I don't mean it as a petty point at all, but that speech in Warsaw was so profound, whether it was right or wrong, mm. it was so profound about democracy, autocracy mm. uh, and the rest of it. It's slightly taken the spotlight off Boris Johnson, who many commentators, even critics, have said he's actually played it very well mm. up to now. It's now Biden centre stage, not Johnson. Yeah, I mean, he. Uh, to be fair, I think he, even his critics, as you say, his critics are saying that he's, he's led um, uh, lethal aid very well, you know, in Europe. Um, he's, he's put himself right at the front and centre of everything. Um, to, to your point, Pauline, I, I do wonder how far... Um, Britain will be involved in any kind of brokering of peace because I, I, I just can't see Putin involving people like Boris Johnson in that deal, as you say. There must be a deal. It It'll will be, be an different. allied team, you know. Yeah, well, I, I imagine it, mm. Putin will demand things of NATO and, and collectively and, and probably the sanctions to be drawn mm. that were put and, and talking about, I mean, Stoltenberg, who's also played a blinder, cannot be in those talks by definition because he's NATO. No, it'll be, mm. I would think it'll be the member states thereof. It won't actually be NATO as such. It will be a group of yeah. of allies, yeah. and they will negotiate, you know, in in national capacities. But but uh, uh, but working and nicking together. something that Sean said and adding it to you, to other people who have been standout. Uh, I personally think Liz Truss has risen to the occasion impressively. She's now thinking ahead about Marshall plans and rebuilding Ukraine. She and Tony Blinken. Yeah. That's a pair I would back. <laughs> right. Would you? Yep. Well, I don't think about that. Yes, I mean, I think I think that uh, clean hands you need, as well. You, well. you need. I would say you probably need more foreign ministers than just those two. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, we've got to have continental Europe in there, right. um, and I think that, and it's it's stronger for us to be negotiating all together because then we're all bound. Yes. Because one of the great uh, dangers as we approach you know, a change of 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 uh, scenery. Uh, is that we then start to fall apart mm. and the Germans want to go back to re-engagement and mm. so on. So we have to have a game plan sure. that unites mm. us all and then put it, you know, t uh, and negotiate together. Direct point to you, mm. and you were listening graciously, mm. carefully <laughs> to what those two just said. A, would Putin accept that, talking to people at foreign minister, foreign secretary level? Or he could, I'm president, I talk to presidents. Well, I... Or would it be Lavrov? Now, that would be Lavrov. It would be Lavrov at yeah, the moment. But one thing I'm concerned about is negotiations. The Russian view of negotiations is a time to regroup. Mm. And it worries Which me. they've done twice before. Yeah, yeah. we're not there yet, you know. Absolutely. You've got to be very careful that you have close observance. If they're regrouping, you've got to walk away from those negotiations. But half his generals have died. One's been arrested for sharing secrets. Another allegedly was run over by a tank crew on his own yes. side. I mean, the generals are in a pretty dodgy position at the moment. 
Well, that's the problem that I was enumerating yeah. earlier. Where's he getting his advice yeah. from to help him deal with the situation? That's why I think we need to find somebody that's acceptable to him and acceptable to the West initially before we start very detailed negotiations. Because that was my experience um, with Gorbachev and with his predecessors. They need somebody that they see will only yeah. mediate in some way yeah. and not just take one strong point of view. Final that, observation that is, for me on Gorbachev a... is the standout moment of that, going back to history that, that we all know very well, although you're a bit, bit younger than the rest of us, but, you know, <laughs> was that when, when, when uh, Helmut Kohl wanted a united Germany uh, after the wall had come down, he did a deal with Gorbachev which involved a lot of money and both sides got what they wanted. So it is doable. Mm. It's always doable if both parties want a deal. But if one party sees that the other party is weak, which is what yeah. he's seen all along, you name it, Afghanistan, every way triggered in his mind yeah. that he could win this. We have to draw a line there, unfortunately, but you two are coming back a bit later on to talk about uh, the implications of this, also for the domestic economy mm. and defence mm. spending. Uh, but for that, thank you very much indeed. Great insights and great thoughts, and uh, we will undoubtedly be hearing a lot more from our viewers. But for the time being, thank you all very much indeed. Uh, you are watching and listening to Alistair Stewart and quite brilliant friends. We've lots more coming up on today's programme. We'll be crossing live to Scotland where those 52 children from a Ukrainian orphanage have arrived and will start their new lives here in the United Kingdom. All of that and a lot more with our Scotland reporter next. But first, here's the weather. Looking ahead to this afternoon and the UK is looking dry with a good deal of sunshine, although cloud will continue to affect some areas. Let's take a look at the details. The south coast of Devon and Cornwall will see patchy cloud at times, but most of southwest England will have wall-to-wall -wall sunshine. It'll become pleasantly warm there. There's There'll still be areas of low cloud affecting the southeast, keeping it cooler than of late, although the clouds should break at times to give some brighter spells. Eastern parts of Wales will also see some cloud, but elsewhere across the country, a good deal of sunshine is expected. The northwest of England will also see a little cloud coming and going, but in the sunnier spells, temperatures will climb into the mid to high teens, which is above the late March average. Patchy clouds shouldn't spoil conditions too much across the northeast of England, and with light winds here, it'll feel reasonably warm. Southern and eastern Scotland will have some cloud, but the majority of the country will be bathed with plenty of early spring sunshine, top temperatures around 17 to 18 degrees. The north and west of Northern Ireland could see some cloud during the afternoon, but a dry and fairly sunny second half to the day is likely. It'll remain dry everywhere this evening, with the clearer skies reserved for the northwest and far south. That's how the weather is shaping up for the rest of the day. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. Basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News.
I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Uh, welcome back. It's inching towards half past 12 and you're watching and listening to Alistair Stewart and friends here on GB News TV and radio. Now, a group of 52 children from orphanages in Dnipro in Ukraine have arrived at their temporary new homes in Scotland. They'll stay in the Calendar area, beautiful part of Scotland there in the borders, uh, near Stirling, which has a magnificent castle as well. I'm biased, I know, but there we are. Then they move on to Edinburgh in small family-style groups. Our Scotland reporter, Davy Donaldson, joins me live now this morning. Uh, this is just upside, upside, upside story. Uh, an extraordinary tale, Davy. Tell us more. Yeah, Alistair, it's an absolutely wonderful story, a real heartwarming story uh, in the midst of what is a, obviously a, a very brutal situation in the Ukraine. So to get 52 orphaned kids uh, out of Ukraine via Poland, they came via Warsaw, they flew Warsaw to Heathrow uh, and then on to Scotland where they're in calendar now. Uh, we understand that their things are going really well, they're settling in nicely, even playing football uh, and these children are between 2 to 18 years old. They've got five carers with them as well. So and I have to say, given the, the weather we've got here in Calendar, uh, it's certainly not a bad place to be. But yeah, this has taken a lot of time and effort by various groups. Um, certainly uh, the Hibernian Football Club, Dnipro Charity, that was one of them. Save a Child was involved as well. Another one that was instrumental in making this uh, a reality was Daniel Berger. It was as bizarre as, um, hello mate, how are you? I'm in the Ukraine with a group of orphans at the moment, trying to get them to Poland. Uh, you know, Shai Weiss at Virgin Atlantic. Uh, do you think you could get him to get us a plane? And I thought that'd be so ridiculous. Virgin aren't going to send a plane to Warsaw and um, they don't fly there. And well, you know the rest of the story. Um, 13 days later, uh, we landed back in Heathrow with the children and they care us. So it's been crazy, but we did it. We did it. When you're so close to it and in it and speaking to all the parties from the Ukrainian government, the Polish government, British government, all of the charities involved, and sort of, I'm so in the moment that I'm not really realizing actually, I know the end game, but we're not there. And we had this sort of, uh, are we, aren't we going on Monday uh, situation. And so when Wednesday came and we were actually Firstly, wheels up in Warsaw with the kids, and then there was that euphoria that we're, we're on our way and the kids' first experience on a plane. But when we landed at Heathrow, the doors opened and we're all waving goodbye at the top of the steps. Um, there's that dawn of realisation that if they're going off to start this next chapter of their lives and we're all just crying. Everyone's crying and hugging each other because we've done it and every single person on that plane played their part in um, making this happen. I was saying the other day to my colleagues that this is the best demonstration of British society coming together and working for common good. And I think uh, if this group has highlighted anything to the nation, it's what can be achieved. And you know, hats off to everybody involved, from Ian Blackford to Lord Harrington to all the governments and to everyone. Um, when you come together and you work together, so much can be achieved. I just hope that more come and it isn't as painful a process as it's been this time round. Yeah, Daniel Berger there, and I think quite right, exactly what he's saying there, that it's amazing what can be achieved with all these people working together, the charities, the politicians, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all coming together for a common goal to make sure that these children uh, get a new start in life. Uh, and they've certainly got that. I wanted to pick up on one thing that Daniel said, and, and, and you've just knocked 
uh, nodded your head towards it. Ian Blackford uh, is, is not always the most popular member of Parliament at Prime Minister's question time, and Boris Johnson you know, dismisses him as the wee crofter and things like that. But I found it intriguing in Prime Minister's questions that the more Blackford pushed it, the more it became clear that Johnson, as Prime Minister and a Tory, was absolutely four square behind him and did what he could behind the scenes to help. I mean, it's not only... Uh, as Daniel said, the United Kingdom at its best. It's actually our political class at its best as well. Oh, yeah, I think so. No doubt about that. Ian Blackford, obviously, and Boris Johnson have crossed swords many, many times uh, in Parliament and uh, certainly don't normally see eye to eye. I think we're all known about that. But I think on this particular issue, they've worked together. Ian Blackford raised the plight in the Parliament and uh, Boris Johnson uh, did what he could and backed him, which is, again, something, as I say, we don't see too often. No, indeed. Davey, great story, and thank you very much indeed. And through you, thanks to, uh, to Daniel and, and the rest of the team involved in it. It's an upside story, and we all need a few more of those. Thank you very much indeed. David Donaldson there, our Scotland correspondent, with that wonderful story about the 52 youngsters. You're watching and listening to Alistair Stewart and Friends. We have plenty more still to come this afternoon. 90s pop legend Chesney Hawkes will be sitting right there uh, in the studio to discuss his latest album. Uh, that will be out very soon. And what COVID was like for someone who makes a living out of live performances. But first, let's bring you right up to date with all of the news. Once again, here's Bethany Elsie. Thanks, Alistair. Good afternoon. It's 34 minutes past 12. The chief of Ukraine's military intelligence is warning Russia is trying to split Ukraine in two by uniting occupied territories in the east. Local media reports the head of the self-proclaimed Luhansk Republic has said the region may hold a referendum on joining Russia. Western Ukraine, which has been largely unaffected by shelling during the conflict, has come under increasing fire. The country's interior ministry says Russia has started to target food storage facilities and fuel depots in Lviv. Overnight, four missiles hit the city, around 40 miles from the Polish border. The White House has been swift to deny that U.S. president was calling for regime change in Moscow. Joe Biden had said Vladimir Putin cannot remain in power and branded him a butcher during his visit to Poland yesterday. In other news, police investigating a hijacking security alert in Belfast have arrested a 41-year-old man under the Terrorism Act. A 38-year-old woman has also been arrested on suspicion of possessing a firearm under suspicious circumstances. On Friday, Irish Foreign Affairs Minister Simon Coveney was evacuated from a peace and reconciliation event in North Belfast due to the alert. Police said the driver of a van was threatened by two gunmen and forced to drive a device which he believed to be a live bomb in the church. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge have left the Caribbean, ending their eight-day tour. It was a trip marked by protests over the British Empire and criticism that the trip reflected a throwback to colonial times. Prince William has since released a statement to say he's committed to service and not telling people what to do. Well, TV online and DB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Alistair Stewart and Friends. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us.
Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. It's uh, just coming up to 20 to 1, and you're watching and listening to Alistair Stewart and friends here on GB News. Uh, I asked you to share your views and thoughts on our big topic of the day, the ongoing crisis in Ukraine, and Joe Biden's important speech about regime change in Russia, Vladimir Putin, and the rest of it. Uh, specifically, if someone uh, is called a war criminal and a butcher, why wouldn't you call him uh, to call for him to be toppled. Um, just can take three now and we'll find time for some more later on because they really have been good. Let's start off with Alex. Uh, Russia won't be able to return to normal relations with the rest of the world with Putin in place. Who wants to stand next to him in the G20 photo? And here comes Alex's nice little twist at the end. Although Trudeau might find that they have plenty in common. Boom. Uh, Matt joins the conversation. As soon as an oligarch puts a $100 million bounty on Putin's head, it is regime change. And finally, at this juncture, uh, let's take this one from Mark. Mark says, because everyone in the West is afraid of causing offence. Joe Biden, for once, talked sense. Uh, an intriguing little cross-section, as I say, just three there, lots more to come. We'll find time for them later on. Keep the views coming in and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are at GB News. Now, sitting quietly listening to that, I'm delighted to say is Mr Chesney Hawkes, always synonymous with the brilliant 1990s international smash hit the one and only, which spent five weeks at number one in the UK and entered the top ten in the United States of America. His career is so much more than that, however, and he's continued to write, record and tour, releasing four studio albums over the intervening years since that debut single. Before we find out what he's up to right now, let's revisit Chesney's global mega hit. He was sitting there and they were watching it. I, I suspect you've seen it once or twice in the yeah. intervening years. It, it still <laughs> seems like looking at a cartoon character, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, the hair, certainly, but, but yeah. who am I to make comments? <laughs> but I, I'm going to start off with a, with a serious question, because you are a professional musician. You don't only perform, you write, you know about words, you know about music. There aren't that many songs, singles, that fit into that criteria of being so good, so popular, touching such a chord, that they last that long. Right. Do you have any grasp, as an artist, what the magic <laughs> formula is? I mean, I, God, I, w I wish I did. Yeah, I'll uh, bet. I, w I would uh, redo the formula and... Uh, <laughs> I mean, honestly, I, I would, obviously that's something I've had 30 years to think about. Um, I think there's something to say about the... Uh, self-empowerment message in the song itself. You know, I am the one and only, nobody I'd rather be. I think people relate to that and have, and I've, I've had many, many people come up to me over the years and said, you know, 
it's helped them through their lives to kind of, you know, face their fears and, and believe in themselves. And, yes. and perhaps that, perhaps the lyrical content has something to do with that. There's also the durability of performance. And again, anyone who watches this programme knows that I'm a huge Rolling Stones fan. Oh, you are? And, and it, you know, 60 years and yeah. they're just about to start touring again. It's not only about writing songs that touch a chord, it's about having something that means that folk who, when that was first shown, were teeny boppers, are still coming back to see you live. Yeah, absolutely, and I still... I, nowadays, they're all, you know, mums with kids and, and I have that relatability myself because I'm, uh, you know, I'm not a mum, but I'm a dad with kids. And, and uh, you know, also, my father was in the tremolos, so... Uh, I've seen all of that, uh, you know, as a child. I, come do you know, I, this is where I beat myself up because I love popular music. I did not know that. Brian Poole and the Tremolos. Yes, yeah. What well, did Dad play? Uh, Dad was the, actually the lead singer after... Well, he joined when, uh, with, when Brian Poole was in the band yeah. and then Brian left and Dad stepped forward as the lead singer and bass player, so... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, so it was in the genes, it was inevitable. Uh, yeah, I mean, my, my upbringing was very rock and roll, Alistair. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, my dad's friends were 60s superstars like Jerry Marsden and Dave Dozy, Beaky Mick and Titch were Uncle Dave and Uncle Dozy, you know. So, so yeah, guitars propped up in every corner. How extraordinary. But the, the, the whole, all my interview notes have now just gone out. They've just gone, yeah, let's this, talk this, tremolos. Is a, this is a different era, because <laughs> yes. what your dad and those people that you've just mentioned are yes. describing perfectly was really a turning point in popular music. Oh, they were you, pioneers. You, you'd had the Beatles yeah. and, and, and the Mersey Beat. This was a yeah. new lot who were coming in saying, we'll have some of that. Yeah, totally, yeah. I, I guess the Beatles kind of, you know, started the change of uh, musicality change in popular uh, music. And then, as you said, like bands like the Marmalade, Herman's Hermits, yeah. the, uh, all, and the Tremolos, and they came along. And, 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 of course, all the American bands too. And they started, uh, like, they, it's, it's actually, for me, they were the pioneers of popular music. Beatles started it. The other interesting thing, you say Herman's Hermits as, 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 a, as a, almost a throw line, of course, the, the lead singer went on to become an actor and made a very successful career in that respect. You stuck to the trade. I did, but I, it's funny you should mention it, because I started as an actor because uh, I, I was in a... a Child film. actor. Well, yeah, I was young. I was 17 when yeah. I got the part in, the, in Buddy's Song with Roger Daltrey, and that's what gave me my big break. But really, the only reason I wanted to do that Film is because I knew that there was a potential record deal at the end of it. So, and that was, you know, in those days, that was how you made it. It was like you had uh, the you tried to get the elusive record deal, you know. So I thought it was my in. And that was what obviously you knew a lot of people in the business. Whereas nowadays, um, if it was you, you'd be hoping to go on the X Factor or Britain's Got Talent <laughs> and hope to be spotted by Simon and signed up to. Well, I, I guess it the... was a different world in that respect as well, wasn't it? it... I mean, it was Huey Green and Opportunity Knock, which is slightly different. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I did do a, a show called Sky Search for a Star back then when I was like. 15 or something like that. So they've always been around, as you say, Huey Green, and then it was Keith Chegwin that uh, was promoting that one. And yeah, so it's all, that side of things has always been there. But for me, it was always about playing live, you know, and, and being noticed in that way, you know, and of course, writing songs. Yes. So those are the two, the two most important things. I, I sometimes I work with, as you say, I write songs and have mentored um, young artists and worked with young artists. And it's one of the things that my dad, Roger Daltrey, people I've toured with like Brian Adams and Huey Lewis always said to me, never come off the road. Yeah. Just keep playing, keep playing around. And I think, uh, you know, one of the reasons that you were asking about the longevity of, of the record and and my career, I think that's why I'm sitting here talking to you now. Sure. Because I've, I've been out there and I've paid my dues on the road, yeah. you know? Oh, and that, I told you, I give you licence to waive it. That, it's that's waived. The, that's, that's the new album. <laughs> uh, but but that, that's, that, that's going back over the years, that stuff that you've done that's been successful, as well as new stuff? Yeah, well, basically, it's, it's a box set of all of my albums from uh, 1991 to 2012. Mm. And uh, it's, it's like a walk down memory lane for me, mm. really. You know, I kind of went back in and it, it includes all of the albums as they were um, recorded mm. and released, but also lots of little rarities, old demos and things. And I went yeah. back to 
Yeah. But when you you must sense it because again the Stones get criticised for it because everyone's oh yeah okay fine so Keith <laughs> did a new album and mixed on a bit on his own away but just do satisfaction jumping back <laughs> of course. do you sense that when you stand up there and 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 you're trying new stuff out on them uh, and playing it live and, and and there they are sitting saying yeah okay fine just get on with just the get one on with the hit will you <laughs> 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 yeah I mean listen. I am. I, um, it depends on what kind of gig I'm doing. If yeah. I'm playing a, 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 an acoustic gig or something where it's all my fans come in, I get other songs requested, of course. But yes, people want to hear the one and only. And I do understand uh, that a lot of people out there, your, your uh, viewers, will, will really only know me for that one song. But that's the great thing about being able to to put something like this together. Yeah, totally. Um, it, How. This segues beautifully to, to the whole conversation because you, you, you nodded towards it earlier on. How tough was the COVID, the two years and the lockdowns um, for Chesney Hawks, not only as an artist and a, 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 and a writer and, and, yeah. and performer, but also as a husband and a dad? Well, funnily enough, uh, for me, I actually really loved the time of just getting off the train uh, and just spending time with my family, board games, dinners with the kids, uh, taking the dogs for a walk. It, it, you know, I mean, I do that when I'm home, but I'm, I'm very, because I live in Los Angeles, so I, I, I'm back and forth so much that I spend a lot of time away. So I actually really, really loved the time. Financially, it wasn't great, you know, no. I, I, and I missed being on stage and, and seeing the crowds, you know, I did a few online gigs. Um, but generally, uh, you know, th that time off would, is something that would never have happened mm. if it wasn't for what was going on in the world. Obviously, <laughs> I wouldn't want to, to, to bring that back. <laughs> no. Um, but, uh, but, you know, you have to try and find the good uh, in, in things, don't yeah. you? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, you, you mentioned earlier as well about collaboration and, and, and mentoring. Mm. Um, I listened to a brilliant interview um, uh, with with Elton John, who who used a lot of the lockdown period, uh, there was an album at the end of it inevitably, but collaborating and working with rising stars, new artists. Yeah. And and, and the point he made is that you actually learn as an established artist yourself from these bright young things who are the new you. Of course, I, I always because I do work with a lot of young artists, up and coming artists, and I I always say any time I have a, a co co writing session with anyone. Um, you learn something, mm. you know, you hope that they learn something from you and, and you learn something from them. I mean, he's absolutely you right. You just have to be very careful about copyright these days with Ed Sheeran. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that's, that's my melody, not yours. <laughs> um, the other point, uh, to round it off, is, is that I know and love your industry well enough to know uh, that the business model, if you mm. have a new album, whether it's greatest hits or brand new stuff, has to be paralleled with live tours. That that's yeah. what promotes it. That's how people get to hear it. Are you match fit? Oh yeah. I mean, I, I came straight when I first came back into to playing live. It was like, Ooh, what is this thing around my neck? <laughs> how do we and do who, this? Again? And who are all those who are people, all these people? Out there? But what was wonderful about it, I actually was quite shocked at myself at how emotional I was when I walked on stage. You know, because there's actual people there and they were actually here to see me and, and, and enjoying live music. And, and there's that kind of beautiful crowd mentality of like, yes. Can you see together. eyeballs and smiles? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And, and absolutely loving being on stage again. It's really wonderful. Well, we wish you well. It's a real pleasure. Uh, to meet you when the team said, oh, we've got... And I said, oh, great, yeah. Oh, that's great. But, but to go through the tremolos and, uh, and Brian Poole and your dad and, yeah. and uh, Dave D, Dozy, Beaky, Beaky Mick and Titch. I never thought I'd say that on GP. <laughs> I have now said it. Chesney, a real honour. Thank you so much for having me. I wish you all answers. the success in the world and love to the family as well. I will do. Thank, Thank you me. very much indeed. <sighs> really enjoyed that. Hope you did too. You're watching and listening to Alistair Stewart and friends and new friends. <laughs> Lots more coming up on the programme this afternoon, including a friend of mine who's a cheesemaker with Rural Roots who'll be telling us about his great British business, amongst other things. But first, let's bring you up to date with the weather. Looking ahead to this afternoon and the UK is looking dry with a good deal of sunshine, although cloud will continue to affect some areas. Let's take a look at the details. The south coast of Devon and Cornwall will see patchy cloud at times, but most of southwest England will have wall-to-wall -wall sunshine and it will become pleasantly warm there. There's There'll still be areas of low cloud affecting the southeast, keeping it cooler than of late, although the clouds should break at times to give some brighter spells. Eastern parts of Wales will also see some cloud, but elsewhere across the country, a good deal of sunshine is expected. 
The northwest of England will also see a little cloud coming and going, but in the sunnier spells, temperatures will climb into the mid to high teens, which is above the late March average. Patchy clouds shouldn't spoil conditions too much across the northeast of England, and with light winds here, it'll feel reasonably warm. Southern and eastern Scotland will have some cloud, but the majority of the country will be bathed with plenty of early spring sunshine, top temperatures around 17 to 18 degrees. The north and west of Northern Ireland could see some cloud during the afternoon, but a dry and fairly sunny second half to the day is likely. It'll remain dry everywhere this evening, with the clearer skies reserved for the northwest and far south. That's how the weather is shaping up for the rest of the day. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. It's uh, five to one and you're watching and listening to Alistair Stewart and friends here on GB News. My next guest and friend is a remarkable guy. I first met him when he was DJing at a party that his brother had thrown. His brother is the rather straight-laced former Member of Parliament and now Ambassador to Cuba, George Hollingbury. He is a celebrated cheesemaker, Richard Hollingbury, and I'm delighted to welcome him. A very good morning, good afternoon to you, sir. And there you are in all of your glory. We tried to do this before, and we had a few hiccups, but I'm glad that all is well now. Um, you and your Godminster cheese are based in the West Country. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But you grew up in the North, and childhood was also about business. Your dad founded Comet Warehouses, so entrepreneurialism, business, in the blood. Well, I would hope so. Um, certainly my father gave me some very simple tips along the way. Um, I think one of the best one was a third hard work, a third good luck and a third good timing, which is the one I remember as a standout. Absolutely. And, and as a result of the, the family sold Comet and made some money. Uh, but you are not just a rich lad who had a good chance. You're academically qualified as a farmer. You know about this business and you've worked very hard to make it work. But why did you choose cheese and arable farming? Well, when uh, at the time I was at uh, uh, college, dairy farming was in a very, very good state um, with quotas. So that was all the talk at the time. And uh, I had been to university down in Exeter in the West Country, absolutely fell in love with it. And so dairy farming, or at least a mixed dairy farm, seemed, seemed the right option to me. 
and, and what's doubly clever, Richard, is that, and you explained this to me when we chatted the other day, uh, that the farm is still at the heart of the business, but the actual cheese manufacturing, you've now, as it were, sublet, that's probably the wrong word, but, but people make it under your brand for you, and you're the distributor, but you still run the farm. That's correct. And actually, when we started, the, <coughs> excuse me, the first batch of cheese we made was only with our milk. And just due to the nature of the dairy business, you know, um, scale is all important these days. So very quickly it became one part to four, and then it's been diluted from there. But we had the brand, we have the recipe, uh, we certainly have our own milk, which we're very proud of. And uh, in fact, about nearly half of it is sold uh, locally in bottles as, as liquid milk. Uh, and it's very popular. I think the people that sell it for us sell, I think, have 276 outlets. So it's a great milk in its own right. And again, I was always told, if you're going to be a farmer uh, and you're not going to be a huge player, then it's got to be a product, not a commodity. So that's why we decided to do the government's to chatter. Yeah, and absolutely environmentally a product and making sure that it's done in the right way and that standards are met. Is that easy to do when you get somebody else to make your cheese according to your recipe uh, and your rules? No, not really. Um, the process of cheese making itself is, is basically exactly the same. Um, it's what comes before that that's so important. As you, as you know, and as we've spoken about, um, what was always passionate for me is doing the organic farming. I, I studied geology and geography at university. So I've always, and also because I didn't, didn't have a farming background, I've always thought um, I've, I've sort of approached it in a more sort of ecological way rather than scientific way. So, um, as I say, the, for me, it's as much as look, uh, looking after the ecosystem and the ecology of what we're doing here, because as we all know, biodiversity is going down and so on and so forth. So if we can come up with a system that, uh, that obviously makes a good product for, you know, and again, we're, we're only 60 percent self-sufficient in food in this country. So if we can make a product that's very good and hopefully we're doing our bit for the environment at the same time, then, then that's a tick-tick for me. Absolutely. How tough did the spring statement uh, make life for you? Because a lot of farming friends um, of mine in Hampshire say energy prices are dreadful. Uh, Fertiliser costs mean that you can basically not use it anymore because it's too expensive, even if I think your farm probably doesn't use it. Um, use but, exactly. but, no, I, I, yeah, OK, but energy you do. But also national <laughs> insurance, people who work for you, you've got to pay that as well as them paying it. Are you worried about the commercial outlook? Um, I would say I'm concerned, I, um, especially with what's going on abroad, as we know at the moment. Um, I think there's going to be, um, I don't think people realise quite how much supply came from Ukraine. Obviously, we've had the increase in prices as well, and also the Brexit factor. Um, so in the last 12, well, no, we've always done it, but it, we've, we've um, upped our game in the last 12 to 18 months. I think it's more important than ever to look after the people that you do have. Um, and I'm very, very blessed. I've got an absolutely fantastic team who seem to be um, batting the same game as I am. And we are all determined to make it work, even though, obviously, as, as we say, we're in very uncertain times at the moment. Richard, I wish you well. I'm so grateful that you found time for us this afternoon and love to all the family as well. I hope to see you soon. God bless. Nice to speak to you, Alistair. Uh, and that was uh, Richard Hollingbury talking about cheese. And it is just a few seconds past one o'clock and you're watching Alistair Stewart and Friends here on GB News TV and radio. Lots more to come. Hello and welcome if you've just joined us. Hello and thank you so much indeed if you've been with us since 12 o'clock. Either way, I'm very grateful. Uh, the time is now just a little past one o'clock and I'm Alistair Stewart and we are into the final hour of our programme. I'll be keeping you company uh, here on TV and radio and we have plenty more still to come, including more of our top discussion with Dame Pauline Neville-Jones, uh, Sean Worth uh, uh, and also uh, other guests on Ukraine and the economy. Uh, also this year, uh, hour, uh, as Number 10 plans another tax rebate after backlashes over uh, his spring, after Boris Johnson and spring statement. Is that spin in the newspapers or is it for real? But first, this is certainly for real. Let's bring you right up to date with the news. Here's Bethany Elsie.
Thanks, Alistair. Good afternoon. It's one minute past one. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. Ukraine is warning Russia is trying to split the country in two by uniting occupied territories in the east. The chief of Ukraine's military intelligence predicts guerrilla warfare will begin in those areas soon. Local media reports the leader of the self-proclaimed Luhansk Republic has said the region could hold a referendum on joining Russia. Two humanitarian corridors have been agreed for today out of Donetsk and Luhansk to evacuate civilians. Western Ukraine has come under increasing fire recently. The country's interior ministry says Russia has started to target food storage facilities and fuel depots in Lviv. Overnight, four missiles hit the city just 40 miles from the Polish border. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has asked Western countries if they're intimidated by Russia and demanded more military supplies. Only 1% of all NATO aircraft and 1% of all NATO tanks. 1%. We did not ask for more and we do not ask for more. We have already been waiting for 31 days. So who is running the Euro-Atlantic community? Is it still Moscow because of threats? The White House has denied the U.S. president was calling for regime change in Moscow. Joe Biden called Vladimir Putin a butcher and said he cannot remain in power. He made an impassioned speech in Warsaw after meeting with Poland's president and Ukrainian refugees yesterday. The Kremlin has responded, saying the people of Russia, not America, should choose its leader. NATO historian Dr. Peter Chadwick Adams believes Biden's comments were meant to reassure nations who are at risk of Putin. Putin's aggression. Um, and so his comments yesterday, they can be taken out of context by Russia, and they were always going to be, was aimed really at reassuring those nations who feel most nervous about Russia. And I think that's what he achieved. In other news, police investigating a hijacking and security alert in Belfast have arrested a man under the Terrorism Act. A woman has also been arrested on suspicion of possessing a firearm in suspicious circumstances. On Friday, Irish Foreign Affairs Minister Simon Coveney had to be evacuated from peace and reconciliation event in northern Belfast due to the alert. Police said a van driver was threatened by two gunmen and forced to drive a device which he believed was a live bomb to a church. Some 200,000 children are off school in England due to coronavirus. That's according to the Education Secretary, Nadeem Zahawi, who said further information about lateral flow tests will be set out on Friday, when mass-free testing in England ends. The government says free tests will only be made available to the most vulnerable. But an education union is warning removing free access when COVID-19 cases are high feels irresponsible. Meanwhile, 600,000 people are being invited for COVID booster jabs next week. It's as infection levels reach a record high in England, when official figures estimate one in 16 people had coronavirus last week. Professor Hugh Pennington, a bacteriologist at the University of Aberdeen, says the virus is unlike any other. One thing that's absolutely characteristic about all the variants of uh, COVID is uh, the relationship with age. The older you are, the more likely you are to have a whole, um, you know, a hard time. And that's why they're focusing with the booster on, on you know, uh, on people with, you know, damaged immune systems. But also, uh, and the most important group in terms of numbers are, are the elderly. After two years, Gatwick Airport is reopening its South Terminal to meet expected strong demand for people going abroad this summer. It was closed in June 2020 to reduce costs during the pandemic. London's Gatwick's Chief Executive Officer, Stuart Wingate, says travelling is now almost back to pre-pandemic levels. The, uh, the summer season ahead of us, uh, we're going to start to see more airlines uh, operating at the airport and we're going to start recovering. Uh, back towards 2019 passenger levels. There's absolutely no question that there's strong demand. Uh, we know that by talking to all of our key airlines. Uh, so we call it pent-up demand, people who haven't been able to travel, who really now want to travel. 
and the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge have left the Caribbean ending their eight-day tour. It was a trip marked by protests over the British Empire and criticism that the trip reflected a throwback to colonial times. Prince William has since released a statement to say he's committed to service and not to telling people what to do. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to Alice Stewart and friends. Bethany, thanks very much indeed. I am Alastair Stewart, and until two o'clock, I'll be keeping company along with friends and friendly guests. Still to come, Chancellor is considering a new proposal for a new council tax rebate following backlash over Rishi Sunak's tax plans that were announced in the spring statement this week. How does that affect the war in Ukraine? Are we going to have to pay more in taxes for defence spending as well? Plus, the Education Secretary, Nadim Zahawi, will roll out plans to create a stronger school system in a white paper to be published next week. But what do schools actually want? I'll be speaking to a head teacher about that. And she was the first ever female Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs. Dame Margaret Beckett has announced that she's standing down at the next general election and retiring. I'll be talking to her and discussing the war in Ukraine as well. GB News is all about you, our viewers. Any burning questions or stories that you think we need to cover, no matter how big or small, we want to hear them. Get your voice heard by emailing gbviews at gbnews.uk and do put Alastair Stewart in the subject line. As with all Saturdays and indeed Sundays, you buy your newspapers, you take your pick. But we began today's programme at noon talking about what leads the Telegraph that says, for God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. Uh, the Observer, at the other end of the political spectrum, also says, Biden, butcher Putin, cannot be allowed to stay in power. And then along comes the Sunday Times that says, panicking number 10 plans another energy handout. So I want to shift our conversation uh, slightly in that direction now to continue our conversation uh, about Ukraine, but also to put it in a uh, political, domestic and even economic context. Same guests are all back and I'm delighted to start with you on the Sunday time. I mean, we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but I want to drill down into it slightly. Is this just number 10, number 11 spin wars? Uh, or is the pressure such? Forget about Ukraine, forget about Russia at the moment. Ordinary folk out there mm. care more about the bills that are going to hit them come next month. Well, yeah, I mean, remember a short time ago, Boris Johnson was embroiled in this, this Partygate scandal and his, his personal ratings are plummeting. So, and since then, he's, he's had a pretty sort of mild time of it and he's, he's kind of on the up. So the spring statement that came out uh, last week, uh, sorry, this week, wasn't it? This Wednesday, um, it didn't seem to please anybody. And, and I think, and we can get into this, but I, I think the Chancellor was actually holding back because the, the cost of living crisis that we're all talking about will get more and more difficult. So he's got to, he can't just do everything now. He's got to do something later as well to, to satisfy people that the government's taking this issue seriously. Yeah. And number 10 has thought, oh, well, uh, the, the communications around this event have gone so badly, <clears throat> we better tell people that we are going to do something. And that they're just sort of dropping out a few messages. I think that's what's going on. Does it queer the pitch for a prime minister who is trying to run a major international episode when actually the dogs are barking behind him and are beginning to bite his heel on a domestic economic story? Well, I think Dame Pauline any, Neville -Jones. I think any government obviously wants you know, wants to have a fairly tranquil domestic scene if they are if they are focusing on a major crisis so it's it's not helpful on the other hand you know you have to walk, walk and chew gum at the same time when you're prime minister yeah so I think this is part of the game. And, of course, we have the May local elections coming up. So, you know, that does put pressure on the government. Yeah. The other side of the coin, ironically, and again, remembering that you, Anthony, when you were running Kodak and were doing deals and, and business with the old Soviet Union and now modern Russia, it's beginning to hurt in Russia as well. We hear stories about people not being able to get hold of sugar, Buckwheat is, is, is running low, prices are going up. It, it's a good old-fashioned economic crisis at home. And there's not much Putin can do about that. 
No, but what worries me, it's playing into his narrative that the West is against Russia. And in my view, you talk about regime change, the only people who can change ultimately is at an election which you're not going to have. So putting this tremendous pressure on the Russian people, in my view, actually helps Putin to say the West is against us. This is what's causing the problem, not me and the war. So it's not only a division. That's intriguing. I hadn't thought that bit through. It's not only, Dame Pauline, a division about democracy and autocracy. Mm -hmm. It's also about economics, which is a universal. Yeah. I have to say to Anthony, I don't know what else the West could have done. Uh, I mean, we don't want to take military action. Uh, what else do we do to demonstrate that actually this is something that you know, is totally unacceptable, what he's up, what he's up to? So it's a, it's a very difficult choice. What, one, what, what I think we, we need to avoid when we get to the stage of negotiation actually is not maintaining sanctions of a kind which really do hit ordinary, ordinary Russians. Mm. So we have to modify the pattern. But yeah, we... And you will have seen, Dame Pauline, mm. in the Telegraph today, this big full-page interview with Liz Truss, who a couple of days ago talked about Marshall Plan and is now saying if there is uh, a, an escape route that can be negotiated for Putin, then the sanctions will come off very, very quickly and it will be back to business as normal. Well, I don't know about that. But... <laughs> well, I, I think, don't either, I think, particularly I think with that's oligarchs too... and yeah. bad money in London. And I think, you know, we've got to alter our, our pattern of, of energy energy procurement and consumption. I mean, this, is, this ha does have to change. We mustn't lay ourselves open to being vulnerable and, and to being dependent. So there has to be a change there. But uh, indefinite punishment of the, of the Russian people, not a clever policy. What's more, that will push the, a broken Russia into the arms of China. That does not make sense. So we have to have a modulated policy. But that we would go back to normal, normal life, I rather doubt. I mean, this does have long-term serious consequences, very sadly. Which is why we're talking about it in two chunks, I, mm. because you know, the world is changing. I don't go for the sort of Great Reset stuff, mm. but, but there is no doubt at all that the world is changing. And we touched upon this earlier on, Sean, and I want to, again, drill a little bit further into it. Uh, Tobias Elwood was on, on the programme, the, the, the chair of the Defence Select Committee. Mm. Uh, and I think at the moment there are quite a few powerful men and women running the Select <laughs> Committees, just watching very carefully what ministers <laughs> yes. are up to. But one of the points that Tobias made, quite bluntly, is after all of that tussle about levels of defence spending as measured by percentages of GDP, and, and Trump was the one who read the riot act to Europe mm. all those years ago as well. You've got to pull your weight. Mm. Tobias is now talking about 3% of GDP. Mm. That's a big, big jump if you're then looking at national insurance, energy levies and stuff. Mm. It is, I, I've actually had this debate with um, an MP uh, uh, this week, actually, about whether there is a kind of reset going on in the public mind in the UK. Remember only a few years ago, um, a lot of the political establishment didn't want us to have Trident and didn't want us to spend <laughs> too much on uh, defence at all. And now we're in this situation and those exact uh, politicians are now completely changing their tune. Ed Davey uh, uh, is one of the leader of Lib Democrats. Um, and, you know, does it, may, does it mean people will take a slightly harder-headed view of economics? Because, I, I, you know, in, in benign uh, political times, you always get the expectation, and we, we had a bit of this this week, that every time a chancellor walks in the room, he's going to hand out smarties and pay for childcare and all the, all the sorts of things that people think government should pay for. Mm. Does this reset things a bit? And make us understand that government sure. is not there to... Well, I, your intriguing kids. for all of you, but coming in on you, Sean, but, but, but Anthony and Pauline come in on it as well. Um, talked at some length yesterday with Peter Lilly, who famously had a little list of people who are up to no good um, all those years ago on, mm -hmm. on, on the welfare state. But, but my core question was the degree to which nowadays, whenever there's a problem, People say, oh, the government's got to sort it out, without necessarily clocking the fact that government does not have money, as Margaret Thatcher famously said. It's you, Pauline, Anthony, right. and also businesses. Is, that exactly, penny is think, dropping loud. Um, exactly, and that's, that's my... I, I agree with that, and yeah. that's my point, really. I mean, and are we getting to a, a position where people are kind of, uh, you know, having to recognise we need to wean ourselves mm. off this? So, actually, if you look at the wider economic picture... We still spend way more than um, we, we should do economically. Uh, we don't produce enough. We, we, we have a growing, ageing population. You know, the NHS is going to... Yeah. You know, the current model is unaffordable, yeah. but we're going to have to fund it. 
Um, but business, Anthony, yeah. as I just said to my friend Richard Hollingbury, the cheesemaker from the West Country, George Hollingbury's uh, brother, um, that, that if we talk about higher rates of national insurance, that's employers as well, that's business, you, a, a world that you occupied for, for decades and indeed still do. But it's also a higher rate of corporate taxation facing businesses going from 19 to 25 in the next 18 months. Well, in my view, that is a mistake. We want growth. We're going to get stagflation if we're not careful. We're going to tax heavily, but we're not getting growth. If you look at it, the last year of 3% has given the government more than it expected. So why not carry on with that path? But you must spend, in my view, more on defence. Even if we can't do all we want to do elsewhere, defence is the only thing that Putin and maybe Iran and China will understand. They won't understand if we get a fantastic education system. What they will listen and watch is whether we're serious. And the final thing, I feel we've made a huge mistake, is we're still buying coal, gas and oil, which is fueling the money to go and fight. Why the West can't have a year or two of privation while they find alternatives, while they look at whether they can reopen coal mines, gas areas, but we've got to accept that that is fueling the intent. Dame Pauline, let me bring you in to stick those two points together, both the Tobias Elwood 3%, and I noticed that you, you were nodding um, when, when Sean and I were discussing that point. But I want to take you back to what I said uh, in our first conversation, and that is that the jaw-dropping realisation that when both Andrew Rawnsley and The Observer and Janet Daly in The Telegraph both say, we may, and I'm talking about our generation very much, we may have spent the peace dividend post-89 too soon. And folk nowadays, as both of these guys have just said, have got to realise the primary responsibility of government is the defence of the nation, and that is now more in jeopardy than it has been in living memory. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. I mean, I think it is fair cop, you know, that we, we lowered the guard too far, we spent too little, uh, and you do have to rectify that. I don't know whether where Tobias gets his 3%, I don't know whether it needs to be 3%, but certainly two things certainly need to happen. One is the reduction for Europe as a whole on on Russian hydrocarbons, no question about that, which is linked to a part of defence which people don't talk about much. They think in terms of you know, arms, and we will certainly need to you know, restock, because we're giving you know, a lot of our stock mm. at the moment to, to Ukraine. Um, but it's resilience. You know, it is actually... Sorry, making... You mean the anti-missile, anti-tank yes, missiles that. and will, stuff that, like that? That'll yeah. have to be you know, restocked. All of which because, costs. Yes, mm. all of which costs. But secondly... The bit of defence that people don't think about, but which is really very important, is increasing our self self security, our you know, our our ability actually to withstand shocks. That's partly to do with energy security, but it's also to do with increasing our cyber security. It's it's n enabling this country actually to you know, weather bad times and weather e difficult economic and political conditions, and for people to know. You know, that if they try to deal with the, U the UK, they will get a tough response. All of that is, 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 in many respects, the government knows that, but there's a lot of implementation that has yeah. to go on. I mean, it's that weird thing, it's simply because we haven't talked about it for so long, because yeah. whether it was this Libya, been... Iran, Iraq... I mean, we did talk a little bit about whether Saddam Hussein had chemical, biological weapons, but that was another yeah. issue. But I'm um, take you back... Um, uh, Anthony, to, to an era that, that, again, we've either read about or we remember ourselves, and that was the Cuban Missile Crisis, where nuclear weapons were front and centre. Khrushchev knew that. Jack Kennedy knew that. They held their line, and eventually a deal was done over the placement of nuclear weapons in Turkey that meant both could withdraw mm. and the world was saved. Have we got such open minds and such brilliant perception front and centre today, because there's a lot of loose talk, both in the United States of America and in Moscow, about chemical weapons, first strike of nuclear weapons. I mean, set my blood cold, literally. Well, this is the big dilemma. Do you want a third world war by mistake, or do you want to try and find a way out? Now, if you go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis, 
I understand from my Russian friends that there were no warheads, nuclear warheads, on those ships that were sailing to Cuba because they wouldn't have trusted Castro with them. So it was a degree of bluff involved on both sides. And I don't think that America would have fired a first nuclear weapon. We don't know. But coming back to the situation now, this is what worries me, that I don't think Putin is like Khrushchev. Khrushchev was held in check and got rid of by his colleagues when they felt he was becoming too big a person in his own right. I don't see anybody doing that with Putin now, and this is the concern I've got, that I think it's much more unstable than it was. So in my view, if everybody stops buying hydrocarbons, gets their defence spending up, I don't mind whether it's 3% or 4%, it's not a figure, but make clear to Putin that there's a real cost. And it's not just us. Mm. All of Europe's got to do it. And America mm -hmm. uh, is the key. Sure, absolutely. But, but Germany says it's going to spend, but they're not even sending the help to Ukraine they've agreed no. to. So it, it, Helmets initially caused them yeah, a lot of uh, got a, a lot of yeah. We've got a couple of minutes left. I want to bring Dame Pauline in, and then I, I can finish with, with, with Sean, if I may. Uh, on that point uh, uh, about loose talk of mm. the use of chemical weapons mm. and loose talk about nuclear weapons, does that worry you as much as it worries me? Well, again, sir, I don't know whether it's loose or not, there is a real fear that this is where we may escalate. And what worries people is what kind of a response is appropriate that doesn't actually create an, the, the scenario for a larger war. I mean, I, I think there are answers, and I think they're wise of them not to speculate on what those might be. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we, we do stand the risk of actually going into, into a quite, quite different scenario. I would hope that they're not mad enough, actually, to use. They do have first strike in their doctrine. This is part mm -hmm. of the problem with nuclear. Uh, let's hope they don't go that far. And there is, and I mean, chemical would be terrible, yeah. but not as bad as nuclear. Yeah. Uh, final, final point to you, and actually mm. Dame Pauline's just, just, just said it before I was going to say <laughs> it, but uh, it was the one bit that shocked me more than anything, and that was Joe Biden, President of the United States of America, saying, on the record, we retain the right, for the first time in my memory, to use nuclear weapons first strike, as mm. Pauline just mm. said, if the interests of the United States of America are challenged. Mm. Does that terrify your generation as well? Absolutely, yeah, very terrifying. And, um, you know, the, the chilling line from Putin actually was that, um, you know, if, if he's forced to, to use nuclear weapons, he knows full well it will destroy the entire world, but he can't see a world worth, worth existing if it doesn't have a powerful Russia in it. Um, you know, that's the sort of language that I think a lot of, a lot of people in today's generation have never heard from. They do have smaller before. scale than destroying the world. But yeah. nevertheless, it's quite terrifying enough. <laughs> Freedom yeah. Common, Michael Heseltine and <laughs> cruise missiles. Um, Sean uh, and Anthony and Dame Pauline, always a real pleasure. Um, thank you both for coming back again. I hope you'll do it again. And thanks for becoming a part of the team. And I hope you'll remain uh, a part of the team, Anthony, as well. But for the time being, thank you all very much indeed. Uh, pretty sombre stuff to end on there, but I hope food for thought for you as well. Uh, it really does matter to us that we air these issues and speak openly and frankly, but with authority, as all of my guests just did. We've more still to come uh, in the last half hour uh, of the programme here on Alistair Stewart and Friends. After the break, we'll be talking to a head teacher to find out what his view is on the Education Secretary's proposal for a stronger school system and tougher examinations. But first, let's bring you up to date with the weather. Looking ahead to this afternoon and the UK is looking dry with a good deal of sunshine, although cloud will continue to affect some areas. Let's take a look at the details. The south coast of Devon and Cornwall will see patchy cloud at times, but most of southwest England will have wall-to-wall -wall sunshine. It'll become pleasantly warm there. There's There'll still be areas of low cloud affecting the southeast, keeping it cooler than of late, although the cloud should break at times to give some brighter spells. Eastern parts of Wales will also see some cloud, but elsewhere across the country, a good deal of sunshine is expected. The northwest of England will also see a little cloud coming and going, but in the sunnier spells, temperatures will climb into the mid to high teens, which is above the late March average. Patchy cloud shouldn't spoil conditions too much across the northeast of England, and with light winds here, it'll feel reasonably warm. 
Southern and eastern Scotland will have some cloud, but the majority of the country will be bathed with plenty of early spring sunshine, top temperatures around 17 to 18 degrees. The north and west of Northern Ireland could see some cloud during the afternoon, but a dry and fairly sunny second half to the day is likely. It'll remain dry everywhere this evening, with the clearer skies reserved for the northwest and far south. That's how the weather is shaping up for the rest of the day. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. It's just coming up to half past one and you're watching and listening to Alison Stewart and Friends here on GB News TV and radio. The Education Secretary, Nadim Zawi, will roll out plans to create a stronger school system in a white paper to be published next week. A white paper means that's a government intention to change the law. Recently, Zawi told head teachers that the future of the school system included all schools being part of a stronger trust but how are our schools expected to make these changes without adequate funding? And there's also the big, big issue of catch up. Now, I wanted to speak to one of our head teachers who can tell us how this will impact upon them rather than another politician and how it impacts upon the students that they teach. And I'm delighted, therefore, to be joined now by uh, Glyn Potts, head teacher at Newman Roman Catholic College, uh, to offer uh, his take. Thank you very much indeed. First and foremost, one step back from white papers and all of the argument that's going on in the political world. As a head, how does the post-COVID recovery challenge look to you right now? Well, forgive me, sir, I'm not so sure we're over COVID in schools. We're still facing significant disruption. I know some colleagues uh, have got uh, examination year groups out at home again, uh, and I'm not making excuses. We, you know, we want the children in school, we want to deal with it, but to say that this is actually finished would do a disservice to those colleagues who are working so incredibly hard to keep the system going. I think the conversation has just moved on. You, when the Education Secretary said, and it's reported widely in the papers, never lockdown again and ruled that out. I, I absolutely agree. I think there are other ways we can do it. We took the decision at the time when we felt it was best to do so when it was about protecting the NHS. 
we're not at that point anymore. So let's start the conversation about what we can do to make sure education continues and is right for every young person. It isn't necessarily about recovery. It's about a redesign of a system that has inbuilt inequalities since day one. This should be the opportunity to really raise the ambition for our young people. Schools shouldn't just be closed over uh, half terms and holidays. They should be open. They are public buildings. They are for children. Let's fill them and give opportunity galore to our young people. Totally agree with that. I mean, in terms of a more egalitarian school system, I mean, there's a brutal truth that the private sector cope much better with COVID, whether that's to do with money uh, or commitment, than, than some of the state schools did. I mean, would you like to put your head above the parapet and tell us why that was the case? Well, I think it's, it's clear that they had access to facilities and to resources that state schools just didn't in those initial uh, few months of the pandemic. But, you know, I'm not here to kick private, uh, private schools. They do a fabulous job and children who go there and parents choose them. Absolutely right. But equally, I'm here to defend the 1,517 children I look after, uh, and we're facing a decline in funding. The government will say that's not the case. Uh, come and visit our schools. You'll see this, this. You'll see that impact. Recruitment is incredibly difficult for teachers at the moment. I've got to join an academy chain because we want stronger trust schools. Because my school is a good school, we have to pay our own legal fees. Parents need to know that's fifty thousand pounds. That's a teacher. How am I going to justify joining an academy chain when it's going to cost me a teacher that the, the parents and the children desperately want? Yeah, and I, to be clear, I, I, I didn't want to try and make a point having a go at either side of it, but I mean, I, as you know, my daughter uh, is in the education world as well, and she said that was the standout thing. It was facilities, it was laptops, it was uh, the capacity to, to help those kids as they go along. So here is, here's the tough, straightforward political question then. Uh, Nadim's white paper uh, says one of the great solutions to the COVID catch-up and life in general going forward is a longer school week. Uh, if you were marking that as a piece of homework, how would you score it, Glenn? Uh, well, I don't think he's shown he's working out. Uh, and as we know, when you do that, you quite often miss the learning point. Uh, you know, my school is open already at those hours. Uh, over 80% of schools were already doing um, the suggested 32 and a half hours a week. But that doesn't take into account all the extra opportunities that's given to young people at the end of the academic school day. What we're talking about here is the learning time of curriculum. Schools aren't just that. Schools give children an opportunity to do Duke of Edinburgh, to, be, to do the Combined Cadet Force, to do drama, to do music. Let's start a grown-up conversation about the ambition we want for our young people. COVID has given us the licence to do that. Let's not try and score political points, but build something that really makes a difference for these young people, because they desperately need it. I love the point about let's see his workings out and let, we'll, we'll certainly look out for that when the white paper comes out. Final quick one. He also talks in the white paper uh, about making two of the three utterly crucial GCSE exams, English and mathematics, tougher, more challenging, because young people will need both of those when they go into real life, whatever they end up doing. Are you on side on that? Well, that seems to be the line that's been pulled out every year for the last five or six years. I welcome any kind of academic rigour, particularly in English and mathematics, because they are crucial. But let's change this idea that you, if you get below a four, you have somehow failed your GCSEs in English or maths. This should be about appropriate pathways for young people into a life of some success. Let's not rule out the electricians, uh, the, the plasterers, the artists. It isn't just about going to university. It's about contributing to society and giving children success for a later life. Great to talk to you again, uh, uh, Glyn Potts, head teacher of Newham Roman Catholic College in Oldham. Thank you very much indeed and keep in touch with us. Thank you, sir. You're watching and listening to Alistair Stewart and Friends, and we've plenty more still to come this afternoon. The former Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Dame Margaret Beckett, will be joining me in just a moment to discuss the unfoldings in Ukraine. Plus, she's announced her retirement as a Labour MP. All of that to come, but first, let's bring you up to date with the latest news. Here once again is Bethany Elsie. Good afternoon. It's 35 minutes past one. I am Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. Ukraine's foreign ministry says all referendums by Russia in occupied territories will have no legal basis. It's after local media reported that the head of the self-proclaimed Luhansk Republic said that the region may hold a referendum on joining Russia. The chief of Ukraine's military intelligence is warning Russia is trying to split Ukraine in two by uniting occupied territories in the east. 
The White House has denied the US president was calling for regime change in Moscow. Joe Biden had said Vladimir Putin cannot remain in power. He also branded him a butcher during his visit to Poland yesterday. In other news, police investigating a hijacking and security alert in Belfast have arrested a 41-year-old man under the Terrorism Act. A 38-year-old woman has also been arrested on suspicion of possessing a firearm in suspicious circumstances. On Friday, Irish Foreign Affairs Minister Simon Coveney was evacuated from a peace and reconciliation event in northern Belfast due to the alert. Police said the driver of a van was threatened by two gunmen and forced to drive a device which he believed to be a live bomb to a church. Some 200,000 children are off school in England due to coronavirus. That's according to the Education Secretary, who said further information about lateral flow tests will be set out on Friday when mass-free testing ends in England. An education union is warning that removing free access when COVID-19 cases are this high feels irresponsible. On TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. It's back to Alistair Stewart and friends in just a moment. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. It's 20 to 2 or thereabouts, and you're watching and listening to Alistair Stewart and Friends here on GB News. My final guest is a dear friend who is a former foreign secretary, a former, albeit briefly, leader of the Labour Party, and a former chair of the Intelligence and Security Committee. Dame Margaret Beckett joins me live now on the day that she confirms she's stepping down from Parliament, which we shall come to in just a moment, Margaret. Uh, you and I are uh, a, a, of an age who remember very clearly the Cold War, the Berlin Wall, Gorbachev, Glasnost, Perestroika. Like me, were you of the belief that maybe those bad days were all over? And did, you, did Ukraine and Putin take you slightly by surprise? Yes, um, it did. Uh, even, uh, you know, I, obviously I took very seriously what our intelligence and the American intelligence people were saying, uh, but you kind of thought, but un unless and until it actually happens, you know, that he's, he's obviously trying to frighten everybody, but I didn't really, well, I suppose I hoped um, that he wouldn't cross the border, especially because, as you say, that seems to me to be tearing up all the hopes that have been 
uh, held ever since the Gorbachev era. And heaven knows Putin's done enough things to make people doubt them and to, to think that maybe things weren't um, going in the right direction. But this is such a, a, a reversal. I feel very sorry for the young who are plunged back into exactly the kind of difficulties and nightmares that you and I knew years ago and that we hoped had gone. Yeah. And, and I tell you the other thing that worries me even more, particularly for the young, and, and that's a, a, a powerful distinction. Uh, Dame Pauline Neville-Jones was just on the, on the sofa and we were chatting about it. The uh -huh. ease with which both Moscow and Washington, Putin and Biden, are talking about first-use nuclear weapons. Yes. Uh, I mean... In the intervening years, as a matter of fact, the last thing I did in the Foreign Office pretty much was to make a speech on behalf of the then government, uh, committing us to pursue a world free of nuclear weapons. Uh, and, and, you know, that had cross-party agreement. And we, we felt then that things were rather going in that direction. But my goodness, they're not now. Worried? Sorry? Are you worried? Yes, I am. Yes, um, because, I mean, what Putin has done is so extraordinary that, you, you know, you can't help wondering whether um, he is ill or whether there are problems uh, that we don't know about. And, and people who have got that much power um, and who have, have lost touch with, with reality, because it seems to me that for him to believe, as he clearly did, that the Ukrainians were just waiting to be welcomed into Russia was, is so far from reality that you do have to worry about it. Help me with this as well, Margaret. We were talking about it at length early on. Um, Joe Biden saying in Warsaw, such are his crimes and offences that this war criminal, this butcher, has got to go and calling for regime change, that immediately the White House says, no, 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 that's not quite what he wanted to know. A world leader like um, uh, Joe Biden mustn't say that. Why not? Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I rather like Joe Biden, uh, and he's clearly a man of, of, of strong emotions and strong compassion, and I have to admit and I expect they thought so too, that when I saw that he was in Poland and meeting people who'd come out of Ukraine and hearing their stories and so on, I was positive you'd get a strong reaction from him. Um, and, you know, when he uh, reacts like that, he says things that, that perhaps a more guarded person wouldn't say. I, I do accept, though, that the White House people are right in saying that he's not really talking about regime change. I'm sure he's hoping that people in Russia are thinking about regime change, but that's not the same thing. Given that, that you know this era so well, but also how uh, the uh, Soviet Union used to work and, and how modern oligarchical Russia works, had you been Foreign Secretary, would you have pushed as forcibly as, as Liz Truss has done on sanctions as being the key leverage to put this guy in his place? Oh, yes, definitely. I mean, well, any weapon that one can use is not actually a, um, a weapon in the hands of our armed forces to, to be using. Uh, yes, ab absolutely. And I, I keep thinking to myself, all, all these years, to be honest, Alistair, if you, if you, I was going to say if you talked, if you listened, to people from like the Baltic states who had been under Russia domination for so long, they would have told you this is what Russia was still like at the drop of a hat. And, and they did. Uh, and, and I think people got a bit impatient with them because they thought, oh, you know, they're living in the past. But they always said that given the opportunity, this is what Putin would do. And I'm afraid it looks as if they were right. Yeah. When... President Zelensky said, and it was uh, a few days, maybe a couple of weeks ago now, an incredibly impassioned speech, and he said, if God forbid Ukraine falls, then next it will be Moldova, next it will be the Baltics, and all the way up to the Berlin Wall. Do you accept that core piece of analysis, 
that this is Vladimir Putin trying to unpick everything that Gorbachev achieved with the fall of the Berlin Wall, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union and that attempt to live in the modern world. He wants to unpick all of it. Well, as I understand it, he has actually said that. Uh, I mean, he said that, uh, you know, definitely that Ukraine has no right to exist. But he's also said, you know, that there are these other countries that ought to be under the influence of Russia, ought to be, um, I would say, under the control of Russia. And I'm quite sure that's what they think he has in mind. And, and I'm sorry to say, I, I, don't get me wrong, this may be hopefully diminishing in view of his present experience. But I'm, I'm sure that when he set out, what he expected was a, to, to be welcomed with open arms in Ukraine, um, for the West to mutter about it, but not do anything effective. And then he was going to start trying to undermine those countries that are now. And, and you know, I'm sure they're, they are thanking heaven that they came into NATO. This is why they came into NATO, because they've never really believed in the, in the moderate, kindly Russia that the rest of us hoped for. Yeah. I want to ask you one specific question, as it were, more on the domestic front. And we just had a, a brilliant report from our Scotland correspondent about the 52 youngsters who've come from Ukraine and uh, are now happily settling uh, in Scotland. Not only as a former foreign secretary, Margaret, but also a chair of the Intelligence Select Committee. Can you at least understand why this Tory government is cautious about security, not simply throwing the door wide open, or do you think they've made a mistake? I can understand them being cautious about security. Uh, I think they're right to be cautious. However, I'm afraid it's looking, it's looking like not just caution, but gross incompetence, uh, a, a mixture of incompetence and, and a very, very hard line policy on refugees and immigration. Um, which just doesn't square at all with the rhetoric about how we're a country that has always welcomed those fleeing from persecution. If Pretty Patel had her way, I don't think we'd welcome anybody. Although the, I will let that one sit on the table because she's not here to answer it, and, and, but I, I know her view is that she's in favour of immigration, but for economic arguments, and that, that's, a, that's an argument that we've had before. Cases, it doesn't work out like that, yes. In I, 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 well, I, I didn't for Gordon Brown either on British jobs for British workers. It's always been a, a fault line through, through British politics. Um, but the point that was made, and I only want to test you on a second version of the same question in a sense, uh, the, the, the Prime Minister pointed out, rather than, than the Home Secretary, uh, that we are dealing with uh, a government and a leader in Putin who is prepared to send people to smear poison on door handles in Salisbury and, and poison people uh, with, with polonium uh, at restaurants in London. Uh, anything is possible, and, and the idea of using the refugee effort as a cover for sending bad people in is not Alice in Wonderland. I will tell you something that I don't think I've ever said before in public, Alistair, or perhaps not even um, in, in the office, because no one wants to seem naive. But when we first heard, I was Foreign Secretary when they murdered Alexander Litvinenko. And when I first heard about it, my immediate thought was that it was probably uh, gangster elements in Russia rather than the government. And I was quite taken aback to realize that immediately my most senior advisors were like, this is the Russian government. And then, of course, because of the mechanism that had been used, it quickly became apparent that, of course, it was the Russian government. But, but my first, uh, as you said earlier, perhaps Gorbachev-related thought was that surely no government would do that. Oh, we've just lost the signal there from, uh, from Derby. Uh, which is a great shame. Um, Margaret Beckett there explaining so that... Of anything. I'm going to... In... Margaret, okay. can you hear me all right? Yes. Right, we lost the signal very, very briefly. I remember exactly where you were in explaining that, that when Litvinenko happened, you were Foreign Secretary, you said you thought it was gangsters and your officials said to you, no, no, we do believe that it is the Russian government. And you were then about to give us your conclusion of those two contrasting views, your initial reaction and what your officials told you. 
Yes, and 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 I um, I sort of kicked myself for naivety, um, but I do think what it means is that the prime minister is. I don't say this very often about this prime minister. Prime minister is right for once that we do have to be careful and we do recognize have to recognize the kind of people that we're dealing with. On the other hand, when it comes to talking about children, um, one may take caution a little too far, perhaps. Yeah, I, I take that point. Uh, and generous there in, in, in giving the judgment uh, that you did to the Prime Minister. Uh, and I heard, heard very clearly what you said about nuclear weapons earlier as the Labour Party. Um, disarmament and getting rid of nuclear weapons is now absolutely, totally, clearly a no-go area for the Labour Party. Keir Starmer's embraced that and taken the right decision, in your view. Oh, it, I was the Foreign Secretary when we put forward a white paper that said that we should keep our deterrent, but that we should prepared, be prepared to foster a campaign for complete multilateral disarmament and pre pre play our part in it, but that we shouldn't, in the interim, you know, we shouldn't set off by giving up our own nuclear weapons. That was the conclusion we came to. We reduced the number as, as much as was thought sensible and safe, um, but we didn't abandon the deterrent at that point. Uh, and that was even at a time when we thought that things were going in the right direction. And I remain of the view that we should push things to go in the right direction. When I was a, a teenager, we've been talking about the teenagers, um, uh, uh, around that time I joined CND. And the reason I did was not because I thought that was better than multilateral disarmament, but it seemed so impossible that there could ever be any kind of multilateral disarmament. But since then, we have seen quite a lot of moves towards disarmament. And one of the things that I do hope is that we don't come out of this with people abandoning efforts to reduce the number and to get rid of nuclear weapons, especially because they're talking now about so-called tactical nuclear weapons. The, the mind boggles. Um, anything that we can do to reduce, we've been very, very lucky over these years never to have a nuclear exchange. This is showing again how close we're sailing to the wind. So people should go on pushing for disarmament. But they've got to do it with their eyes open and taking the right precautions as they do. Margaret, great to see you again, and thank you so much for uh, so much of your time. Um, and uh, everybody who knows you will know what I mean when I say my thanks to you and uh, uh, my my repeated uh, sympathies with you on your recent loss. Uh, you and Leo were always an absolutely brilliant double act. You wouldn't have been able to do anything that you did do without him. And may his uh, may his soul rest. Uh, and uh, my love and thoughts are genuinely with you. Um, thank you very much indeed for your time. Great to see you again. And you. Bless you. Wow. Uh, I knew she was going to be a cracker, but uh, goodness me, Margaret Beckett there on taking the eye off the ball and the naivety, uh, her word, Thank that, you. that we shared with one another uh, about Gorbachev and the Berlin Wall uh, and the need to cling to those... Uh, nuclear weapons purely defensively. Uh, truly remarkable stuff uh, from the great Margaret Beckett. So grateful for her time. Uh, now, we've got, uh, we've got a few minutes to go before we come off air. So uh, I always say that at this stage, waiting to be corrected, we go to the emails now and we start with Belinda. Yes, we do. Brilliant. Um, so Belinda says, I'm sure calling for Putin's head is something that we've all been thinking, but Biden is a statesman, statesman and should think before he talks. Interesting. Tom, uh, totally agree with toppling Putin. How about the UK agrees to send Blair to The Hague if Russia sends Putin? Two birds, one stone and all of that. Uh, that's very naughty, Tom, but uh, I'm sure that it's a, a thought that, uh, that several, uh, not least my old mate George Galloway, shares. Uh, Judith joins the conversation. Conversation. It was a great speech from Biden. It'll go down as one of his best. Be not afraid. Keir, one wonders whether Trump's belligerence uh, would be an asset or a disaster here. Interesting reference to uh, uh, Trump, who, of course, did tell other NATO nations that they had to up their spending on defence. Otherwise, he'd take uh, America's support potentially away. Uh, Vivian, to suggest that the West is aiming for regime change, was unbelievably reckless and risks serious escalation. We should all feel very afraid every time the man speaks. Uh, this comes in from JJ. 
Uh, Putin is an example of why people should not remain in power for 20 years, however little the ordinary Russian can do about that. That's a really important point, JJ, not only about how long folk stay in power, but the fact that the Russians, who Joe Biden addressed directly, saying this is a war that is not worthy of the Russian people, tragically, we know all too well, the Russian people have very little say in the matter. Um, now we've got Jacqueline. Uh, the old saying is... Uh, uh, sorry, we've got Barney. I do beg your pardon. Uh, Barney says if they were to have sanctions lifted, surely Russia would have to present a candidate uh, that has never been connected to the KGB, FSB or GRU. Those are the uh, intelligence services of the Soviet Union and Russia. The Western alliance would need to be assured of some reform. Otherwise, not all sanctions could be removed until they do so. It's a really good point, uh, Barney. Finally, Jacqueline, the old saying is that there's some good that comes out of everything, however tragic. The war in Ukraine will show people below 50 why older people have always been less enthusiastic about Western countries reducing armies and weapons. It also also means that the UK government will be under the spotlight for giving the army and navy the right level of troops and resources. My guests made that point today. My guest Tobias Elwood made it yesterday. I am back 12 o'clock on Saturday. See you next weekend. Very good afternoon to you. Looking ahead to this afternoon and the UK is looking dry with a good deal of sunshine, although cloud will continue to affect some areas. Let's take a look at the details. The south coast of Devon and Cornwall will see patchy cloud at times, but most of southwest England will have wall-to-wall -wall sunshine and it'll become pleasantly warm there. There's There'll still be areas of low cloud affecting the southeast, keeping it cooler than of late, although the cloud should break at times to give some brighter spells. Eastern parts of Wales will also see some cloud, but elsewhere across the country, a good deal of sunshine is expected. The northwest of England will also see a little cloud coming and going, but in the sunnier spells, temperatures will climb into the mid to high teens, which is above the late March average. Patchy clouds shouldn't spoil conditions too much across the northeast of England, and with light winds here, it'll feel reasonably warm. Southern and eastern Scotland will have some cloud, but the majority of the country will be bathed with plenty of early spring sunshine, top temperatures around 17 to 18 degrees. The north and west of Northern Ireland could see some cloud during the afternoon, but a dry and fairly sunny second half to the day is likely. It'll remain dry everywhere this evening, with the clearer skies reserved for the northwest and far south. That's how the weather is shaping up for the rest of the day. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate. From all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories. Make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel. Right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell news.